You have used computers and new technology in your textile work for a number of years now. Could you talk about the relationship between textile technology and computers in your previous work? But I started I started doing things that were more sort of traditional hand weaving, but then realized really when, when I do a lot of reading, I realize textiles is really usually at the forefront of technology, not at the back end. And we tend to think of craftspeople as sort of nice doing nice things the way we did them hundred years ago. And in a sense I kinda wanted to counteract that and show that and yes, that's maybe true for some people, but at the same time, other things are true. And also that, that actually textile has driven a lot of technology. It, it didn't just, it was not just accidental that the industrial revolution affected textiles. A lot of industrial technologies during the industrial revolution were driven by textiles and creating cloth and clothing and looms and all that stuff. You're working on a TC1 loom and I understand this loom is designed for artists. What is the advantage for artists for this kind of loom? Well, oh, that's interesting because in Jakarta weaving, when it was in developed in the 1800s, it was obviously an industrial process because punching cards would take so long. You would only do a design that was either very expensive and somebody would pay a lot for a piece, or you would do it for something where you wanted a lot of the same fabric. So it's not something where you could do, you know, 10 meters or 100 meters, you'd call it 1,000 meters. And now, with a hand loom like this, I can punch uh, I can punch a design and just weave one version and then I do another one. Because my design time is, is it's not, it, it's a certain amount of time, but it doesn't take as long as if I have to punch cards and test the cards. Uh, Could you talk about the technology that Jacquard created? The punch card system, right. Initially, I mean, all weaving is always digital. All weaving is always thread up, thread down. There's nothing you can do in any weaving. They could be, you can do hand uh, uh, tapestry loom, tapestry weaving, where you just do it all by hand and you just pick what you want. Or you can do shawls and fabrics, very short shawls. And then the jacquard loom is just a way that each thread is manipulated individually. And the system to do that was the jacquard loom, so that you could do that. Before that, they had something that was called a draw loom, where they could kind of do this. But um, they developed uh, in the 1800, in, in the 18th century, they developed a lot of automatons and music boxes and automatic player pianos and glockenspiel and all those things. So, so it's kind of, they were doing that technology to automate things. So in a sense, they applied that to weaving and you can either have a drum with things that stick out or you can have punched cards and the punched cards is what ended up being the jacquard. So you punch cards, if there's a hole, then the connection goes through, and if there's no hole, it doesn't. So it's a mechanical system, it's not a, an electronic system. What is the relationship between the jacquard loom and computers? And the computer then, I mean, the most the sort of famous relationship is between Ada Lovelace, who has written, and, and also Babbage, who invented the analytical engine. The analytical engine is sort of the pre-computer pre that was built by Babbage in 1840s, 1840s, and it never quite worked. The, the principle would have worked. And Ada Lovelace wrote about it. And she wrote, she translated a bit text. And part of what she said is was the, the analytical engine weaves algebraic patterns, just as the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. And I always was fascinated by that, how weaving flowers and leaves could in any way be seen as important. Could you talk a little bit about how you create your imagery and how you get it to the loom? Oh yeah, that's interesting. Um, mostly I work in Photoshop, so I kind of take images, and I'm interested in images that are available sort of in, in t on the internet or, or sometimes from my own camera, or the images that I can manipulate. And then once I have an image, I, I, can, I can layer it, collage it in a way that I want. And then I have to reduce the colors into and, and figure out how I'm going to weave it. So if I have black threads, then I can certainly, and I have white threads, I can do any kind of gray tones. Uh, if I introduce other colors, then I have to figure out how that, would, how many different shades of red I could do, for instance. So then I have to, uh, my image has to then be reduced to those image to those colors that I can actually weave. And then, and then I have to give each color. I go into index color, and each color is then a specific uh, specific color, and then I have to create a weave structure for each, 
color that, and then create a weave structure that actually represents that color more or less in the weaving. And then, and then I, uh, I saved the image, and uh, so I work in Photoshop a lot now, on, and then I go into Jacquard, which is a professional uh, software for weaving, and then manipulate the structures more, and check the structures for technical faults and how it weaves, and then I can input it into the room in another file, and, and then it, it, at that point, it's just black and white. At that point, it's just threads up, thread down. So, and then that goes into the loom, and the loom actually just knows that. What interests you in combining virtual topographic maps with historical textile motifs? I, I've done a lot of work with, with nature and florals and sort of the construction of nature and patterns and how, because that's what textile does often, create sort of nice textiles from nature that's often not nice and not so pretty, but they kind of work, it's all organized to make a nice pattern and be a beautiful floral design. And then with satellite images of the Earth, I became really interested in how nature is seen, is sort of mediated by technology to us. So we don't really see it. We see it as a mediated technology. And I, I've always been interested in Donna Haraway, this idea of the cyborg, that in a sense we are part cyborgs. We, we use technology in such an automatic way that we're not, we, we use glasses, you know, we use, and now we use all these devices that let us go talk to somebody else and all that. So I became interested in these images of the earth as nature. So I'm kind of interested in combining uh, that, that view of nature as sort of a bigger scale. And Google Earth is this completely non-romantic space. And I think the Silk Road has a certain romantic association, which I think I'm kind of interested in too. But I find Google Earth is this completely non-romantic space. It seems very real. It, it's, it's, it's very beautiful in some areas, and you know it's very ugly in some. It's not really pretty. It's not somebody who selects a nice image. It's just kind of what's there. Could you tell, talk about the child's vest? Yeah, because that's interesting. That got, that got me interested in the Songkin child. It's, it's kind of one of the real big events in, in, in textile history. How this, this Songtian image traveled from the Secession countries in the Persia, those countries, and then traveled to China eventually. And then Songtian is this, this kingdom in the middle that doesn't exist anymore, but it was woven there. So it's a design that has partly borrowed from one culture and it gradually shifts into another country. And that particular vest in, 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 um, in the art history books has a lining that has a Chinese silk that's a different type of pattern. So this mixing of different patterns interests me. And then gradually, of course, today, we have a complete blurring of symbols. We have people wearing Coca-Cola t-shirts in, in different countries, which of course now is international. But we have um, patterns shifting a lot and, and acquiring new meaning when they travel from one country to another. You've talked a little bit about sort of the phenomenon now of the global textile production. Could you talk a little about that? The global trade, yeah. I, I was going to do work a lot more about that. I think the global trade issue is actually quite interesting. But it's in a sense a more complex story that to kind of deal with sort of in a, in a small way. Um, things are produced in certain countries because production costs in those countries are cheaper. I mean, there's a lot of history about North America, how textiles was in a sense given up by the powers of being to other countries who could produce it cheaper. And, uh, and yes, a lot of jobs are lost in North America, but I think uh, it, it, it's too big of a story to tell in, in a very simplistic way. 